Hi everybody, thank you, thank you for coming. We are trying to, to talk and to cover more of the aspects of IPv6 in Kubernetes that are not clear. But first of all, let me introduce us. I'm Antonio G. I'm Kubernetes contributor since 2019, I think. I started working on IPv6 in Kubernetes. And this talk uh, is because we started you know, in Twitter complaining about IPv6, about Kubernetes, and then we met and say, well, there are a lot, a lot of things that we don't know about IPv6, and people don't know about Kubernetes, and it's not clear how this is working. So why don't we meet and we talk and explain to people what uh, are the problems? Let me introduce myself. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Fernando Gont. I'm uh, an active participant at the IETF, and I have done a lot of you know, work on IPv6. So that's how we ended up you know, getting together and joining forces about this. Go ahead. Yeah, so the, the, the key thing here is I work in Kubernetes and he works in ITF. So they define the standards that we have to use. And in Kubernetes, we have an open source uh, software project. We define the standards that we want to use and we need to use the standards that they define. That is not clear, but I think that you get what I'm trying to mean. So in Kubernetes, oh. okay. There you go. Okay, so here we go. So in any software project, there are two important concepts that we need to clarify. One is the reference architecture, another is the reference implementation. The reference architecture in Kubernetes is what we define with the APIs. We define APIs and we define behaviors. And then Kubernetes is a software project, so we deliver software to implement these APIs. Um, the project is a project that is evolving continuously. So you can see now some of the components of the cluster, but in the past there were more components. The, the project keeps evolving, keeps modularizing the different components, and then defining new APIs. And then is when in a Kubernetes cluster you have a reference architecture and a reference implementation. And this is the first myth, is you don't have to use QProxy, for example. We, Kubernetes, define a service API, and QProxy is an implementation. You don't have to use IP tables. You can use eBPF. You can use other technologies. You don't need have to use a lot of things. So first myth of, of all that we need to clarify is Kubernetes defines APIs, defines behaviors. How Kubernetes ensures these behaviors are compliant? It defines E2E tests. There is a whole conformance project that gives users the the security that they are clusters are conformance with what Kubernetes defines, okay? So we talked about APIs. This is just, uh, we want to touch a bit on this because this is important to understand a bit better what is next in the talk. The API represents an object on the cluster and the API represents the contact that we have with the components and with the clients and with the users. An API, uh, I'm not going to go deep on this, it's defined by a, a group and a version and a kind. And then you have some metadata to define some properties of the objects. And you have two important things here. You have the spec and you have the status. The spec is what the user or the components expect to happen. It's declarative. And the status is what the component on the cluster, report to the user. So it's informative. And this is going to be important uh, later for the present presentation to understand better what are the myths on IPv6. So we can see here, spec is desired state, and status is observed state. So more or less, this is not, was not about networking, was more about general aspect of software development and Kubernetes in general. So let's go a bit deeper. So what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a platform that orchestrates containers, but the container is not the minimum application of Kubernetes, it's the pod. A pod is, we can say, is different containers that are running in the same network namespace. And to run these pods, we need a compute. In Kubernetes, the object that represents the compute is the node. 
So what has a compute? We need network. We are talking about network in this talk. We need an old network. The compute has to be connected somewhere. And we need a pod network. And this is something that Kubernetes already defines. This is what Kubernetes defines is that this pod network has to have some special properties to meet the Kubernetes reference architecture. So it says that every pod should be able to reach every other pod without not in the pod network. It doesn't matter how do you create these networks, where are these networks living? You just need to meet this requirement. Okay? So if we see the API, when you have a node, you are going to have an object like this. Okay? We have different fields, and the, we can see that the, in the status, you have the IP. So what does this mean is that you are not telling Kubernetes, I want a node with this IP. You are saying, the Kubernetes is saying, I have this node, and this node has this IP. It's reporting to us. Who is doing that? Is doing the kubelet. That's some component that Kubernetes clusters have. OK? We can see clearly how the IPs are reflected. There is another option that you can use or not that you can specify the pod network. But this is optional and it's an implementation detail that you don't need to use. Well, this is flipping. OK. OK. So, OK, we have a node. We have pod network. Now, let's create a pod. You can start creating containers, right? We say the container has to live in the same network namespace. But then these containers need to be able to talk. They need, they need a network. How the network is created? Well, the network is created uh, is an implementation detail. The way that this works is the user creates a pod. Say, Kubernetes, I want to create this pod. I have this application. I have these containers. Just please go ahead and create a pod. This go to the API server. The API server does its magic and go to the scheduler. The scheduler say, OK, you have this node that is free. And the scheduler points the modify the object to bind it to a node. Then the node has a component that's called the kubelet and say, OK, I have a pod. I need to start to create a pod. And then there is a protocol that kubelet uses with the container runtime that can be container D or cryo that says, I want to create a pod. That's what Kubernetes says. Kubernetes doesn't say, I want to create this pod with this IP in this network. Kubernetes say to the container runtime, I want to create a pod. When it finishes, the pod has an IP. The container runtime tells the IP to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes says, OK, you have your pod, and this is the IP. So another important thing is that Kubernetes is not declarative about the IPs of the pods. It's an implementation detail. You can assign the IP the, whenever you want. You can use CNI. You can use it's a, a problem on the container runtime. But OK, we have pods. OK, That's so far it's so good. We have the pods. What are we going to do with the pods? Pods are ephemeral. Pods are not living. You cannot rely on the, the IP of one pod. So, like everything in software, we create another abstraction layer that is the service. We need to discover it. We need something consistent. We need to run application. We don't want to run pods, OK? So we create a service. The service for network people is just we can model it as a, as a layer for load balancer, right? Services are complex. We are going to has different types, but we are going to focus on the services with IPs here. Okay, so think on the service like a layer for load balance. It gives you an abstraction. It gives you DNS discovery. So you can say, okay, and the service has another property. It's able to forward all the traffic to a set of pods. So you can aggregate a pods and in the service and say, I want to send my traffic. To okay, so we had the definition of the service, right? We have the service, and we can say service use this IP and expose this port, and with the selector say choose this port. So all the traffic that goes to the, in this case, the IP of the port is 10.96.0.13, but 
Kubernetes does is implements the API. Then there are different components that, impl that implements the service uh, capability that is usually NAT, okay? But you don't have to do NAT. The only thing that you need to do is to obey the properties of the pod network, they say. Every pod should be able to reach every other pod without NAT. And now that I'm saying is the NAT is in the pod to pod communication, <coughs> not in the pod to service communication, okay? Don't get confused. So when the pod tries to read the service, the magic happens, queue proxy, whatever implementation that you have, and say, okay, you can go to any of these pods because I know this service are, uh, has these backends. Once you choose one backend, the packet goes to the backend. And can you see the IPs? The original IP is the origin IP of the pod, and the destination IP is another pod. That means that we have guarantees because of the network model that each pod is going to be able to talk with another pod, okay? So the other pod will see the IP, we do the, the R magic reply, and before sending the packet path, because the original pod was asking the service, we need to switch again the original IP to the pod IP, okay? So far, this is how service work intra-cluster. Okay, but we have another necessity. We need these things to be published. We don't develop just for pods. We need people. We, pe Kubernetes is used by a lot of companies and you need to publish your application. So this is the tricky thing. And Kubernetes was born with IP4. You have all IP before private addresses there. It's because who has the money to spend all these pods and nodes, IPs using public IPs? Okay? It's not easy. So we need to solve a typical network problem. We need to be able to suppose a private IP that is, is inside a network with another private IP to the internet. How do we do that? There are different ways of solving this problem. The, mass, the most common solution is to use a load balance, okay? In this case, we have the type is, the service has a new type that is called load balancer type, right? And you can see, like in the, in the previous example, you can define this is going to be my front end, these are going to be my back ends, and this, in this case, something happened. You see, you can see the status. There is some magic, some controller externally that say, okay, this service is going to have a public IP and this is going to be the public IP. You have a client, send this IP to the client because I'm going to make that your packet goes to my load balancer and from the load balancer I'm going to send you to the node and from the node, I'm going to be able to send you to the pod, okay? So far, so good. We know, like, what are the networking problems that Kubernetes solve? That, and now we are going to understand better. We know that all these limitations are IPv4 limitations. So we are going to understand now better uh, how can we improve this. So um, before actually getting into the, you know, the uh, specifics about you know, um, IPv6 in Kubernetes, um, let me provide like a super brief uh, introduction of, or overview about IPv6. I mean, IPv6 is it's rather complex, so we could be talking about IPv6 for quite a while. I'm, I will try to summarize in a couple, two or three slides, you know, the most important aspects of IPv6 when it comes to Kubernetes, okay? So first of all, you know, in order to understand you know, some of the you know, features or, or the motivations for IPv6 or, or, or uh, yeah, the idea behind IPv6, you have to understand you know, the concept, the, the context in which um, it was developed. Okay? Many, many years ago, like over 20 years ago, it was like, uh, evident at the time that we would run out of IPv4 addresses. Okay? 
uh, you know, the internet was a, a research project that was uh, too successful, if you wish. Um, so it was clear that we ran out of IPv4 addresses. So the question was like, okay, what do we do about it? So essentially there were two different paths to actually solve the problem of IPv4 address exhaustion, okay? One of them were, were like stop gaps, like short-term solutions, uh, things to be able to extend the lifetime of IPv4, and then there was like a, you know, more complicated, if you wish, uh, longer-term solution. So what are the uh, stop gaps? So this is uh, CIDR and BLSM, like essentially what we did was we got rid of, you know, uh, classes in IP addresses, even, you know, when still in a lot of places people still teach TCP IP as if there were like classes in addresses, that has been like long gone, okay? With CIDR, BEL, SM, we got rid of classes. So we just have like, we are uh, in a position to better use, uh, you know, IP addresses, you know, uh, oops, uh, better performance when it comes to routing and also be able to, um, you know, assign, uh, you know, addresses in a more efficient way. That is, no, we were back one, I think. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me find it. It was back a couple of slides. More. Okay. More, yeah, there. Um, so that was the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the stop gaps. And another feature or another, let's say, technology or mechanism that was like super useful, uh, yet, controversial uh, to extend the lifetime of IPv4 was the use of NATs, okay? That's something that, you know, the IETF never liked, still doesn't like, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, ironically one of the most successful technologies, right? So everyone is using, you know, not at home or even here anywhere. So those were the stop gaps, which, you know, they were super successful in extending the lifetime of IPv4, and we still have, you know, we will still have like, you know, IPv4 for quite a long time, probably. So what was the longer term solution? Well, the longer term solution was to uh, engineer a replacement protocol for IPv4. Just, you know, try to produce a protocol that among other things would provide like a larger address space. And this is IPv6. So uh, main goal of IPv6, you will hear a lot of marketing claims about all of the things that IPv6 does, which is for the most part not true. The only <laughs> thing that IPv6 does is provide, you know, more addresses, period. Okay, if you, you know, anybody that makes all their kind of claims, if you ask further, you'll realize that not true. It just provides more addresses. And, you know, an important aspect which, you know, has, uh, you know, affected the, you know, the deployment, et cetera, et cetera, is that IPv6 is backwards incompatible with IPv4. So you might expect, okay, same protocol, different version, so they should be able to interoperate. Well, not true. It's a completely different protocol. Could be named anything else, and it would be the same thing. Incompatible protocol, backwards incompatible protocol. So without a, a flag day, normally we, you'd have like a situation such as this one, okay? You are going to have like systems that only support IPv4, so they are IPv4 only. They will be part of the IPv4 internet, so to speak. Systems that only support IPv6 will be part of the IPv6 only internet, and you will see systems that support support both protocols, the so-called dual stack systems. And of course, since they can speak both languages, both, both protocols, they can, you know, inter interoperate with, you know, uh, uh, or they can participate in the IPv4 internet, so to speak, and the IPv6 internet, if you wish. So that's one of the important aspects of IPv6. Now, the other important aspect is that I mentioned that, you know, the whole point about IPv6 is to provide a larger address space. Okay, so that's probably the most important feature when it comes to IPv6. What can we say about IPv6 addresses? Well, they are 128-bit long addresses, so they are super long, maybe like even too long, if you wish. Um, but then when it comes to other aspects, they are similar to, you know, IPv4 addresses. For example, we will, you know, um, will aggregate addresses for the purpose of routing, so you will see prefixes, you know, in the same way as you see for IPv4. Uh, we have multiple address types, same as in IPv4. There's unicast addresses, multicast addresses, etc. And uh, we also have different address scopes. This is similar to, you know, IPv4. In IPv4, you have private address space, you have like global address space. So this is similar in the IPv6 world too. 
One thing that uh, you might be surprised when you first encounter IPv6 is that IPv6 hosts normally configure multiple addresses with different properties. So you will see the same interface that will have, like, for example, a link local address, a global address, a unique local address, etc. So it's like the common case is for, an, uh, uh, for a network interface to configure multiple IPv6 addresses. Okay. And one final you know, comment summarizing the whole thing is that the typical size for an IPv6 subnet is a slash 64, okay? So 64 bits to actually configure like a host ID or a you know, interface ID, more properly speaking. Now, there's another you know, aspect that is important to highlight, which is the topic of unique local addresses, okay? So essentially, unique local addresses provide like private address space in IPv6. So you could say that it's the equivalent of the private address space from the IPv4 wall, like the so-called RFC 1918 uh, addresses. There's probably one, you know, important, only one important difference in that, you know, the, when you configure ULA addresses, part of the prefix that you use for the addresses should be randomized. So the, the, let's say the, the specification say, says that when you configure a ULA prefix, you should randomize part of the prefix. And the goal of this is that if you were to use ULA space for one network in one company, for example, ULA space for another network in another company, and these two companies eventually were to merge, then you can uh, avoid like address you know, overlaps which you know, in, in IPv4 we find all the time. Like you have one company using 10.0, blah, blah, another company using this, you know, the same other space, and it's OK. But then you know, one company acquires the other, and Houston, we have a problem there. Okay? So ULAs are supposed to help with this. Another thing to add is that ULAs are a controversial feature, controversial topic at the IETF. And the reason being, like you know, the more hardcore IPv6 proponents say, well, we did this whole IPv6 thing to actually provide global addresses. So we are still proposing you know, private addresses for IPv6. But the thing is, the feature is there, and it's useful in many you know, different uh, scenarios. One thing to keep in mind is that the expected use case, expected from the perspective of the, of the ITF, okay, is that you use ULA space for internal communications, but the idea is that you don't use like private address space in combination with NAT, okay? Uh -huh. And obviously the reason is that if we were to do like private address space plus NAT, then why are we moving to IPv6 in the first place, right? So, uh, it was here, okay, there we go. So, what's the deployment model for you know, uh, IPv4 and IPv6 if, you, if we compare the two? Well, if you think about the current architecture for IPv4, essentially you use private address space for your local network and you connect your local network with a NAT to the public internet. You know, obviously, the thing is we don't have enough uh, you know, public IPv4 addresses, so we have to share them. But you know, for IPv6, that's different because since we have like enough, you know, public address space, the idea is that we can provide a public address, a global address, to each system that we have in our network. But normally what you'd want to do is not just simply, you know, connect your network with the router to the public internet because normally you don't want to expose every, you know, all of your systems to the public internet. Even if quite a lot of people argue that you should do that, I'm 100% against that, okay? So that's the deployment model for IPv6. Okay, so now let's, that's kind of like the overview of, you know, IPv6. So uh, yeah. let's talk about how, you know, uh, uh, I, uh, Kubernetes implements IPv6. So we, we talked uh, before about Kubernetes and reference architecture, about APIs, about reference implementation, about implementation. So. When Kubernetes defines the IPv4, you can see in the APIs, you can see the IPv4 address, right? So this is what Kubernetes does. And one important thing in Kubernetes, maybe some people disagree, is the user. So we want to provide a backwards compatibility. We don't want to people to have to change the things. So you have one manifest, and you apply the same manifest and then you got IPv6. That's how Kubernetes implemented IPv6. Transparent to the user, right? But then you have to say, well, but I have IPv4, I need to move to IPv6, and I need to deal with 
dual stack use cases, as Fernando said before. Then, okay, don't worry, we got you. So we have another field. Instead of having singular fields, we add plural fields. And that's how Kubernetes reference architecture, the API, implemented IPVCs and dual stack. They just added the necessary fields so you can apply your manifest in one or the other environment. What is important here is what the implementation did. Yeah, so, um, so essentially this is like a, a, a dual stack, of course, a version of Kubernetes. You have like IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. Now, if you want to think about um, you know, how uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes, uh, or what's a typical implementation for, you know, for incorporating IPv6 support in Kubernetes, essentially it's the architecture that we have in this slide. So essentially, uh, you know, we use um, private address space, ULAs, and you know, connect whatever is using you know private address space with an ad to you know whatever next network like the internet. So there are two things uh, you know to think about this. Like, what's the pro? What's the good thing about this? Well, is that you know the IPv6 support mimics the I the IPv6 support mimics the IPv4 support. So at the end of the day, if you look at this, it's like, well, it's like IPv4 just with IPv6 addresses. So it's easier to understand, you know what to expect, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, you know, that's the reason for which you, know, uh, you will see this kind of, uh, of implementation. Now, so far, so good. Uh, you know, this, this way of implementing IPv6 support is good. Like we have you know, uh, IPv6 support in Kubernetes, but then this also begs the question, like um, we are <coughs> mimicking the IPv4 support in IPv6. And the question is like, are we missing the chance to actually leverage the, uh, IP, uh, the addressing features of IPv6? Like the whole thing is like the whole point of IPv6 is like having more you know, global address space. So if we just do like private addresses plus NAT, it's like we are not adding any kind of value to the, you know, to Kubernetes. So then what we did is like try to ask ourselves, like what could we do different here? Of, of course, like instead of just implementing with IPv6 the same thing as we, in the same way that we do with IPv4, what could we do differently? And obviously things that we could do is at least two things, one of them, would be to provide global unicast addresses to services, okay? And what could we do with that? Well, if the services themselves, they have you know, global addresses, then we can get rid of the load balancer because the service itself is like publicly available. You get rid of the load balancer, you know, you save money in a way, and there's, you know, one, uh, yeah, uh, and there's also like one, you know, the, the, the architecture gets simpler, but we could go like even more hardcore. What if we were to give like the pods themselves like a global address? So now we don't even need the service to have a global address because the pod themselves, like we have plenty of global address space, so we don't need to save addresses. So one thing that could be done is assign you know, global addresses to the pods themselves. And if we could leverage the DNS, you know, to map a name to you know each of the the, the pods that we want to uh, to connect to, then we could get rid of two layers of indirection. We could get rid of the load balancer, and we could get rid of the other layer of nuts. Okay, of course that's part of the story. Okay, you might wonder things like, okay, but if we give all the pods like global addresses, so who's going to protect the pods? What 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 do we do? Uh, you know about that. So obviously there's, you know, all the things to be analyzed and, uh, and questions to be answered. So this would be the case of services with GUAs. Essentially what we do is we get rid of the, of the load balancer, okay? And, you know, we just can contact directly, you know, the service. We don't need the load balancer again. And then there's the other option, which is pods with GUAs. And what we could do is essentially we uh, resolve, you know, the DNS name we get like short-lived, you know, uh, quad records. The idea, of course, you don't want to cache those records for a long time. And then we directly connect to the pods themselves. No load balancer, no service layer in there. Again, lots of details, you know, to be, you know, analyzed. Like, for example, what do we do with the pods? How do we protect the pods if they have global addresses? And this is why, you know, it's to be continued. More analysis to be done. Uh, I think we have some couple of minutes for 
気はない